Hello, everyone. Together with my co-chairs, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to you to this virtual global forum on TB vaccines. I look forward to an exciting conference that will contribute to our common agenda to both accelerate the development of current very promising vaccine candidates and continue our efforts as we innovate and diversify the pipeline for second generation TB vaccines. This conference will showcase the remarkable progress we have made in TB vaccine research and development and make the case for increasing the investment in TB vaccine R&D as a key element in the global health agenda. We're all well aware of the public health and economic justification to invest in TB vaccines. What this conference will show us is the scientific progress the TB vaccine community has and continues to make and the R&D infrastructure that is in place in research labs in collaborative research networks like that of TBBI, in clinical trial sites, and with the key funders and stakeholders working together to the Global TB Vaccine Partnership. We have a greater level of political support for TB R&D than we've ever had before, as leaders from around the world committed to take action to end the tuberculosis epidemic at the United Nations high-level meeting on tuberculosis. You'll have seen a demonstration of this political and global leadership in the program for this forum. And we are honored to have a number of scientific and political leaders in the sessions. I look forward to the research, innovation and product development that will be presented over the next three days. This conference will show the world that the case for increasing investment in TB vaccines is strong and that the TB vaccine community is ready and able to deliver safe, effective, and affordable vaccines for all. Thank you. Um, my thanks to all of you for taking time to join the important presentations and discussions that will take place over the next three days. Iavi is so pleased to be co-hosting the forum for the first time with the Stop TB Partnership on New Vaccines and the Tuberculosis Vaccine Initiative. This global forum comes at a critical time as the world continues to face the tragic consequences and challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. We recognize that this is a challenging time for all of you, all of the participants, all of the speakers, um, with everyone being impacted both professionally and personally, and many of you working on the front lines in direct patient care or in research and development efforts that are uh, seeking to address and ameliorate the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Really, this tremendous global mobilization shows what is possible when the world comes together as best as possible to address urgent public health threats, of which tuberculosis surely fits that bill. We are optimistic that progress can be made on the TB front, just as it's been made on the COVID-19 front. And the world is indebted to all of you for your innovation, your commitment, and your dedication and the sacrifices that all of you have made. We rec as we reflect on the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, we must also think about the opportunities that it presents us. The Global Forum provides us with a time and space to learn from and leverage the many advances we have seen with the COVID-19 response and apply them to our collective effort to accelerate the development of new and highly effective tuberculosis vaccines. It's an opportunity to reinforce the importance of learning and collaboration across areas of research, across disease, um, across diseases and across sectors, and for the world to advance innovative solutions to urgent public health threats, of which TB is really, um, we all know, such an important one. We take this time to reflect and renew our commitment to TB vaccine development, global health innovation, and equitable access. And we thank you for your commitment and your contributions to this work. And we look forward to being with you throughout this uh, meeting's presentations and discussions. My name is Lutika Ditsiwa. I'm the executive director of the Stop TB Partnership. Uh, very uh, honored to be here uh, in this amazing uh, company uh, <coughs> to do uh, what we expect for some time already to uh, be part of this Global TB uh, Vaccine Forum. Um, I have just uh, three points to make. First of all, that uh, 
Uh, I am really uh, happy that we have this gathering and this opportunity. We are now uh, end of uh, April uh, 2021. And I uh, think that uh, it's time for us to uh, make uh, some strong statements around the need for a, a vaccine for TB. Uh, the second point that I want to make is that uh, people that are in this call, people that are in these vaccine forums, uh, organizers, uh, the new tools, uh, the new vaccine working group of the Stop TB Partnership uh, are people that put a lot of their career and their efforts in, in providing us as a TB community with the only tool that will allow us to end TB, a vaccine. And uh, that is an effort that for many people in this call is an effort that went throughout their entire career. It's for some people what they did for their entire life or big part of their life. And personally, I find it unacceptable that after many years of efforts, more than 10, more than 12 years, we are still not having a vaccine for TB and we still look at the horizon that will take us to around 2026 if we want, or even longer, if we want to have a vaccine for TB. So my second message is that uh, I'm, I'm grateful for people that continue to work on this. I'm grateful for everyone being here, but it's difficult to explain and understand why the funding, why the attention and why the support didn't come in such a way that we get a vaccine uh, for TB uh, much earlier. Tuberculosis is hardly hit. This is my third message and uh, last. Tuberculosis hardly uh, was hardly impacted by COVID. Uh, we are nowhere close to reach our UNHLM targets, meaning not only the targets related to the epidemiology, but also the targets that are related to research in terms of advancement of research, in terms of funding of research, in terms of continuing the enrollments on the trials that we were having. Tuberculosis is suffering a lot of a lack of uh, attention and, and funding. We were in a different spot at, uh, in January 2020 with some good mobilization in 2018 and 19 in terms of push and in terms of resources. Because of COVID, we are really uh, in a very difficult status right now. The last point that I make is this. COVID should not mean only the dramas and only the tragedies that we, we see. COVID should be a lesson for all of us that it is possible, that resources are available, that it's possible that researchers come together, that it's possible to have a vaccine developed in 10 months and deployed to millions of people in a few months, that it is possible to give hope to the world that some of these airborne diseases like COVID and like TB can be ended. So my last point is a call for all of us in the TB community and in the researchers that we accept nothing less for TB than it was possible to get for COVID. We should be outraged and we should be restless till we obtain exactly the same type of in engagement, support, effort and funding. And this is my last call and uh, my last point, uh, calling for all of us to be aligned and all our messaging and all our uh, actions should be guided uh, by this uh, uh, joint effort to get the vaccine into NTB by 2030. Thank you very much. Excellencies, colleagues and friends, Dr. Nick Drager, Global Forum Co-Chair and Executive Director, Tuberculosis Vaccine Initiative. Dr. Mark Fenberg, Global Forum Co-Chair, Dr. David Levinson, Chair Stock TB Partnership Working Group on New TB Vaccines. Dr. Luchika Dittiu, Executive Director Stock TB Partnership. Professor Helen Rees, Founder and Executive Director, Wits Reproductive Health and HIV Institute. Dr. Emilio A. Emini, Director, TB and HIV Program. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Dr. Emily R. Belding, Director of the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Dr. Michael Makanga, Executive Director, European and Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership. A very warm welcome to all the distinguished delegates from across the world present today at this prestigious global forum on TB vaccines. Friends, 
Today we are in the middle of an unprecedented global pandemic that is threatening to derail all the progress made by the global community in the fight against tuberculosis. The year 2020 has seen how non-COVID services were greatly impacted due to the compulsion of governments to deploy local and national level lockdowns and other stringent containment measures. National tuberculosis programs around the world have been the victims of this crisis. Decades of progress has been hampered. However, we must not and cannot let this happen. Our efforts towards combating tuberculosis cannot be compromised and we must not let this pandemic undo the gains acquired over the last five years. Under the able leadership of our Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi, we in India have demonstrated unprecedented political commitment to battle this dreadful disease. Not only have we accorded the highest priority to ending tuberculosis by 2025, but we have also tried our best to ensure that COVID does not impact our TB elimination efforts. High quality drugs, digital technology, engaging the private sector and communities, integrating TB services across all levels within the health system are all being constantly aligned to rapidly bring down TB incidence and mortality in the country. With innovative mitigation measures like bi-directional screening, clubbing TB case finding in COVID surveillance and doorstep services, by December 2020, India had almost returned to pre-COVID levels in TB enrollment with over 1.8 million patients notified, 11% more than the estimated projections made by us in April 2020. The private sector too has contributed significantly by notifying over 0.5 million patients. More than 95% of total patients notified were put on treatment. I am proud to announce at this global forum that the Union Territory of Lakshadweep and the District Budgam in Jammu Kashmir in India have been certified as the first tuberculosis free union territory and the first TB free district in the country respectively. And I consider that a small but a very significant achievement in being able to eradicate TB from micro zones as the first step. We all know that tuberculosis continues to be one of India's most critical health challenges, which has devastating health, social and financial consequences for the patients and communities at large. With an estimated 2.64 million TB patients, India has the largest burden of TB globally in terms of absolute numbers. It is a very challenging battle. But friends, we truly believe that this is just the beginning. We have launched a TB Mukt Bharat campaign, which means a campaign on a war footing level to free India of TB, to take the effort towards fighting TB to the community level and making it a people's movement. If a developing nation like India can dream of this, the rest of the world has to think even beyond this. However, to end tuberculosis, we also need to explore newer approaches. We need to accelerate development of new diagnostics, vaccines, drugs, etc. Today, the world lacks an effective TB vaccine and after decades of work on developing a vaccine, there is a pipeline of some potential candidates. But the earliest that a TB vaccine will become available seems to be beyond 2025. However, we all know that this is not going to help any of us achieve the sustainable development goals. 
We have enough lessons to learn from the pandemic. We have to admit that the current pandemic has demonstrated the vulnerability of humankind to exigencies, recognizing that we have to strive to act with greater speed and predictability. The COVID pandemic has shown us that if we unite, we can have a vaccine in less than a year. Like we have done for COVID, we need to advance technology and product development, focus on building and strengthening scientific capabilities and implementation strategies. Through the India TB Research Consortium, the Indian Council of Medical Research is leading this effort for developing new drugs, diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics. They are also closely working with the BRICS TB Research Network for multi-country collaborations. India has always been a manufacturing hub. We have demonstrated the manufacturing capabilities, be it for drugs, vaccines, or diagnostics. I take this opportunity to congratulate all of you for coming together today to discuss TB vaccines. And I also call upon the global community to redouble their efforts and ensure adequate funding so that we can have a TB vaccine by 2023 and end TB in India by 2025 and globally before 2030. I am confident that India can and will lead the way. Friends, these are days of immense grief caused by the pandemic, when lakhs of precious human lives have been lost. And there is socio-economic turbulence all over the world. I shall use this platform to convey my heartfelt condolences to those families across the world and in India who have lost their near and dear ones to this deadly pandemic. I have no words to express my sorrow. Friends, we need an aggressive roadmap to curtail deaths from diseases that can be eliminated. We need a fresh roadmap to address global shortages of medicines and vaccines. I would like to work with all of you on these goals and roadmaps for eliminating tuberculosis. Speaking at this forum today has been a great honor for me. The global forum on TB vaccines is the need of the hour. I am sure all of us present here feel a deep sense of personal responsibility and commitment. I am sure that driving a constant engagement with all stakeholders will help us achieve the ambitious goal that we at the forum have set for ourselves. With these words, I would like to thank you all immensely for having given me this golden opportunity to address a most learned and committed audience. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very insightful and um, moving remarks, Minister. We really appreciate your participation in the meeting. It's now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Helen Reese. Um, Dr. Reese is the founder and executive director of WITS RHI at the University of WITS Watersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa, an organization that is tackling Africa's health challenges through science and innovation. Um, she's a professor at the University of WITS Watersrand's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and co-director of the ALIVE program, the African Leadership in Vaccinology Expertise. She also is the chair of the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority and is you know, very influential in many different areas. And you know, one can find more information about her biography in the meeting materials. But just on a personal note, I'm so fortunate to have Helen as a, a friend and inspiration, someone who is known widely for her wisdom, compassion, generosity, and integrity. And as a result of these, she's a trusted advisor including playing important roles in many key organizations historically, including uh, SAGE at the WHO and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Scientific Advisory Committee. 
because of her remarkable attributes and, and commitment, she's a true global health hero and a role model and mentor for so many. And we're very fortunate to have her speak with us today. Uh, good evening, good morning, good day to everybody. And thank you very much to the organizers of this uh, virtual global forum on TB vaccines. Uh, I was given a very interesting uh, challenge with the title of my talk, which is about levering research across disease areas um, and really looking at how we've managed to do this in the context of COVID the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm going to start right back in history in 1854, something familiar to many of us, when Jon Snow established that the water pump in the centre of London was responsible for a, a very large outbreak of cholera. And having established that through his observations, he removed the handle and the epidemic uh, subsided. But this he's really thought to be one of the fathers of uh, public health. Um, and this is a very famous story. And it's really about observation of disease. I'm also just going to remind us of something completely different, uh, NASA. NASA's spin-off technology has been huge. Uh, it's been anything from cochlear implants to probes that cool the brain. All sorts of things have come from NASA uh, that really wasn't intended at all. And what that tells us is that uh, technology can be a side shoot of uh, things that you weren't necessarily expecting. Uh, but in addition, NASA has also been able to repurpose and, and the rest of science and technology has been able to repurpose some of the inventions that NASA has, has come up with. They've got almost over a hundred of such things. And this is just one example of life-saving sutures uh, that were actually came from the, the Mars probes uh, for clothing that they were developing for, for Mars. So repurposing is another thing that we've learned from the broader scientific environment. So I'm just going to give us some looking at those old lessons and then think about the new context and try and sort of weave in a story about what we have learned and what we've done. And I'm starting with surveillance and epidemiology and my stories are going to have a little bit of TB and quite a lot of COVID in them. So this is a, a, a very famous story, a sad story from uh, South Africa um, in 2006 when a very observant clinician observed on the ward not what he thought was initially MDR-TB, but actually turned out to be XDR-TB, associated very strongly with HIV co-infection. Um, and that really not only showed the, 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 what was happening in terms of infection in Tugela Ferry, which is in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, but it also really stimulated the need for new drugs. Um, and this is also a very sad story. This was um, the whistleblower doctor who sounded the alarm on coronavirus. And he was actually an ophthalmologist, but he was very observant. And he noted that, that he was seeing severe respiratory disease. And he sent this uh, message out on WhatsApp to his, his uh, medical school group. Uh, but sadly, he contracted uh, SARS-CoV-2 and subsequently died. Um, but he, again, used his observation um, and put two and two together quite correctly and was the first person to alert us to the COVID-19 outbreak. So that surveillance and epidemiology, and it continues to be incredibly powerful in what we do. But I'm going to move on now to think about new technologies, spin-off technologies in this regard, in terms of COVID. There's been a lot of rethinking and repurposing, but similarly, with the TB field and, and uh, TB vaccines. So if we think about repurposing, <clears throat> what does it mean? It means that we take existing drugs that are either used for therapeutic reasons or have failed in their development, um, and we look at them and it can be drugs, it can be vaccines, it can be vaccine platforms. Um, and what are the characteristics of repurposing that we've seen during COVID-19? First of all, it can be multidisciplinary, bringing people together from across disciplines. It can leverage research infrastructure. We've seen how the HIV research infrastructure has been turned into COVID vaccine trial infrastructure. Multipurpose technologies combine technologies together. Uh, repurposed medicines we've seen, and I'll mention that a bit more, but BCG and MMR vaccines have been evaluated for prevention of COVID-19. 
We've leveraged knowledge between the private and the public sector. Um, and we've also leveraged multiple benefits from, from single interventions. The example given here is actually from climate change. It's really climate change and pollution. Uh, that you can have a single intervention such as air pollution, which, which will have an impact on global warming, but also improves lung health. And then, of course, leveraging off health services with integrated program delivery. And here I've looked, talked about the IMCI and the EPI programs in terms of vaccination. So repurposing of drugs can take many forms. But one of the other things, not only repurposing, but we've also started to rethink about clinical trial designs. There, in September of last year, there was a, a consultation looking at innovative clinical trial designs for new TB treatments. But there's been a similar consultation on, on clinical trial designs for COVID, clinical trial designs for HIV, and there's similar um, messages coming through. First of all, what can we do to bridge from the preclinical to clinical development phases that uh, is, is innovative and much stronger than that what we already have? What biomarkers can be used to support and accelerate decisions? Um, when we move from phase two to phase three trials, what, is the, what kind of trial designs and the very um, innovative, adaptive and seamless designs are now being introduced? People are looking at new, new phase three trial designs and how they will ultimately affect uh, the ultimate regimen that's delivered. And then very strongly, of course, with COVID, real world evidence and cohort data. So everyone is rethinking how we have traditionally done clinical trials as well. So in terms of repurposing, I've just given you a few examples of how we've repurposed knowledge in the context of the COVID-19 response. In terms of HIV, we've repurposed and looked at other drugs. Uh, lopinavir, ritonavir is an example. We're now looking at mRNA vaccines backwards because they've been so successful in COVID, looking at those for HIV vaccines. We're looking at laboratory um, innovations and, and diagnostics and health systems. What have we learned in terms of HIV from the health system that can be taken into COVID? In terms of the TB field, uh, I think you, all, you will all be very familiar with this, but we've been doing a lot of rethinking about BCG and there have been a number of trials, for example, in adolescents. Uh, seeing whether actually the use of as an adolescent BCG as a booster will have an impact on a disease outcome for T TB. Also been trials looking at different timing, many trials looking at different timing of offering BCG to newborns. So this is taking an existing technology and saying, can we adapt it and do something different with it and get a better outcome? And then there have been a lot of studies looking at whether we can repurpose BCG for COVID-19. Can we use the BCG vaccine phenomena that it's known to induce both humoral and adaptive immunity, that it has this non-specific immune response that, uh, and that can be used to boost the immune system? Uh, people have been very keen to explore whether this could be um, an adjuvant to the <coughs> prevention of sickness and SARS-CoV-2 infection. So you can see the map on the right, the numbers of studies that have actually been done trying to evaluate the potential of BCG um, in this regard. So then <clears throat> repurposing, rethinking it, but then some of the things that perhaps we haven't thought enough about but really have been thrown into the forefront is the issue of access and affordability. So, I'm going to go back then to 2014 with the Ebola outbreak in, in West Africa. Ebola outbreaks have been occurring in the African region since 1976. But even so, when we had the Ebola outbreak, we were unprepared, particularly for the development of vaccines, therapeutics and diagnostics. As a result of that, CEPI was established. It was established as a public health funding mechanism with innovation to accelerate the development of vaccines against emerging infectious diseases and to enable equitable access of these vaccines for affected populations during outbreaks. So it's quite a young organization and has definitely been thrown into the forefront in terms of COVID. So CEPI's uh, mandate has got several components to it. First of all, to de develop rapid response platforms. Um, and in addition to that, to consider proven vaccine technologies that are already at scale, as well as new technologies. 
cepi has been looking at uh, uh, innovative adjuvants, and then the enabling sciences that support clinical trials, things like epidemiology, diagnostics, and really very strongly, and I won't go into this now, really has been looking at global manufacturing capacity, innovations in manufacturing. How can you get uh, manufacturing processes that can be easily transferred to low middle income countries and can be rapidly established? This was CEPI's vaccine portfolio before COVID-19. You could see the, the range of uh, pathogens that had epidemic potential, including MERS, but at the end of it was also disease X, and disease X was always assumed to be a respiratory disease, rapidly spread, um, high mortality possibly, um, and uh, something that we had not previously seen. So we knew it was coming, and for disease X, CEPI invested in a number of vaccine platforms. Now, when COVID-19 came along, CEPI was able to take some of these platforms, such as the Disease X platform and the MERS platform, and rapidly uh, get the innovators to transform their focus to the development of COVID vaccines. Now, I chair the Scientific Advisory Committee for CEPI, and I very strongly recall in January of uh, uh, 2020 that we had an urgent meeting because of the outbreak of an unknown virus in Wuhan. And I also recall very strongly a very senior colleague saying, well, even if this isn't pathogen X, perhaps we as CEPI should do a dry run and invest in vaccines for what turned out to be COVID-19. And that meant that CEPI really became at the forefront of vaccine development. These were some of the vaccines at the early stages that CEPI uh, invested in. And you can see that there are a range of vaccine platforms that were developed, and that was quite deliberate in case you had failure of one platform or failure of manufacture. So CEPI, and, and now there are more calls for proposals, more investments since this time. So we've moved on, and it's not only CEPI involved in these COVID-19 vaccines, but it's uh, many, many different institutions, both private and public. There have been 302 trials, 107 candidate vaccines and 14 approved vaccines as of now. So thinking about this, let's think again about access and affordability. So we've got the vaccines, we've been extraordinarily successful with the vaccines. We are having gremlins in terms of safety. We know that, we knew that the, some things would happen, gremlins in terms of manufacturing. But this has become one of the worst challenges, vaccine equity. You can see on the left-hand side here that the UK and the US and mostly developed countries are rolling out vaccines. And on the right-hand side, a slide from January of this year, where we could see at that stage that there were virtually no vaccines at all in the African region. This was from March from UNAIDS uh, saying uh, that in March of this year, rich vaccines were vaccinating someone every second while the majority of the poorest nations have yet to give a single dose. So equity of access has also become important. And in response to this, the World Health Organization set up the ACT Accelerator. Um, the ACT Accelerator has focused on vaccines, on diagnostics and on therapeutics. In the vaccine field, CEPI, Gavi and the World Health Organization have had different mandates. But Gavi in particular has been given the mandate to drive the COVAX facility. And the COVAX facility is an end-to-end -end solution, which is trying to uh, uh, allow equity of access to vaccines, even for the poorest countries. Because it's, it's recruiting as many countries as want to sign up, it means that there is a, a large pool of demand, which means they can negotiate for a lot of vaccine candidates, that in turn will accelerate scale up of manufacturing. They're also looking at ac equitable access downstream and delivery at scale. And these are all parts of the COVAX facility. And the COVAX facility is really focusing strongly on what's called the AMC, the Advanced Marketing Commitment Countries. And these are some of the poorest countries who will be supported by overseas development assistance. At the moment, as we sit here, the, the target is to have 2 billion vaccine doses out by the end of this year through COVAX. To date, 39 million only have gone out, but this is starting to accelerate. 
The other ambition was to have $2 billion worth of investment, and that's now been exceeded. And all of this is coordinated by Gavi. So finally, I'm going to talk about delivery and the delivery of, uh, the, of vaccines in particular. And I'm giving here an example of malaria. Um, the RTSS malaria vaccine has been in development now for 30 years. But when we got to the point where we were having some efficacy data, because the schedule is different in terms of the EPI program, um, it, it was recommended by the World Health Organization that there should be pilot countries. So three countries are piloting this, and to date, 650,000 children have been immunized with very high uptake, although the schedule is different to the routine EPI program. So there's a lot of optimism that we should get some positive results later this year. Fingers crossed that we might have the first malaria vaccine. But this issue of vaccine innovation and introduction is something that's really important and that COVID has just revolutionized. If you look at this graph, the, the red spots are when a disease was first identified and the blue spots is when they were registered in the United States. And you can see that the long timelines for things like polio, um, for things like um, Ebola, but now you can see COVID-19, that timeline between identification and the blue spot was under a year, unprecedented. So just to wind up and to think about what we've really learned and some things that are going to be challenging us in, in the future, uh, there's now a proposal for a global pandemic treaty. And the aim of this, and it's been signed up to so far by 20 global leaders, is to dispel temptations of isolationism and nationalism and address challenges that can only be achieved together in the spirit of solidarity and cooperation, namely peace, prosperity, health and security. 20 global leaders, sadly not yet, the US, Russia, China or the EU, and I hope that we will be able to move to a new pandemic treaty. And I'm going to leave you with a message back to history again, going full circle. There were lessons that we learned from the US government's efforts to produce penicillin during World War II. This was an extremely successful scientific and commercial endeavor. And why was it successful? Because it was rooted in government stewardship, intra-industry cooperation, and the open exchange of scientific information and specimens. This was really ahead of its game and it allowed penicillin to be commercialized and rolled out and saved many lives. So the question that we can ask ourselves now, is this a template for effective policy solutions that concentrate primarily on science rather than commercial goals? With that, I'm going to say thank you and thanks to the colleagues who assisted me with this talk. And I wish you well with this very important conference. Thank you so much. Helen, thanks so much for that very insightful and, and valuable presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I have time for one question and I'll take the prerogative of asking the question myself. Um, I mean, you've clearly witnessed and so eloquently described the rapid response to COVID-19 and how effectively that has advanced, but you also witness every day in South Africa the tragedy that TB um, exacts on the population there. And we see such a different level of attention in innovation and investment brought to these different diseases. Um, what do you see as the opportunities to take advantage of the new models and new ideas and, and new science to accelerate TB vaccine development? Yes, I, I think that that is completely the right question even for this whole uh, discussion to take in the next uh, two and three days. Because, you know, we have learned we can do things much more rapidly. Uh, the innovation has been extraordinary. The second thing is we're beginning to see very quickly some of the platforms that appear to be uh, uh, highly effective in the context of COVID. And can we utilize those? As we know, there are discussions about that. Um, but the third thing is, and, and I think it, it goes with, you know, you know self-examination. And there's several self-examination points. And I know it's, it's great that there are our donors and supporters of the TB field in, in, in this conference. I mean, one of them is, are we investing enough? I mean, money has flowed into the COVID effort, but are we really investing enough for a disease that remains, you know, one of the major killers in, in this region 
Uh, we heard from India, a huge killer still in the world, uh, despite all of the years of effort of, of trying to find vaccines. Um, and also, we, we think we need to reflect on the fact that it's still largely a, a disease that's affecting poorer people and poorer communities. So why is it that we're not mobilizing more resources? So I think that in terms of vaccine development, if uh, hopefully if there are good things to come out of COVID, one of them is to say how important vaccines are in terms of control and elimination of diseases. And if we want to achieve these ambitions of uh, elimination of, of, of TB, both at, at a country and regional levels, but also globally, we, we, we need, we desperately need better vaccines and the clock is, 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 is ticking. So I think that that, you know, that is, issue in terms of, of vaccines, we've, we've, we've learned that. The second is that I, I wonder whether, in fact, and if you look at media coverage of vaccines, population coverage. I suspect that the general population now knows more about vaccines than at any other point in history. Um, and uh, if we were to now go back and say and try and mobilize popular support for a disease that continues to be devastating, um, I, I wonder whether we're going to get a much bigger uh, sort of well, realm of support. I just uh, came off a, a TV interview here for a very popular South African TV show that does in-depth investigative journalism. And they really like to, to stir things up, but they really wanted me to say on that interview how important vaccines are to stop the pandemic. So the message that's coming through in terms of media, social media platforms, is that actually we want positive messages. We want supportive messages for vaccines. Um, but I think that the challenge for TB is that the fatigue that's come with years of, of slow development. And I think that as a collective, we need to think how we address that. Thanks so much. Well, I know we have to move on in the program, but I just want to thank you again for your participation. Really appreciate it. Well, let me begin by welcoming everyone to the Global Forum on TB Vaccines, a virtual forum this year. Uh, and uh, I know that the meeting uh, was delayed uh, for a bit of time given the current circumstances in which we which we find ourselves, but I'm glad that uh, we had the opportunity to pull the meeting together. So again, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Emilio Amini. I am the director of the TB and HIV programs at uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, you know, the TB program uh, has been an area of focus at the foundation, oh, almost essentially you know, since the start of the foundation, almost 20 years ago. And uh, in recent years, we've been very heavily focused on programs in specific countries that have high TB burdens, uh, trying to uh, improve diagnosis, improve treatment, uh, uh, and uh, improve other aspects of uh, TB control in those countries. We have a, a significant presence in South Africa, in India, and in recent years in China as well. Uh, as part of our R&D effort, we remain focused on the development of novel point of care diagnostics for TB in order to improve uh, the uh, extent and timing of TB diagnosis. We have been working for many years on improving and shortening TB treatment regimens. Uh, and then of course, we have been dedicated to TB vaccine R&D, uh, again, essentially pretty much since um, uh, the start of the foundation's efforts on, uh, on TB. As many of you know, uh, the foundation hosts every year, or tries to host every year, uh, again, you know, having been distracted a bit by the, by the COVID pandemic, we, we host a collaboration for uh, TB vaccine discovery, which is a forum that uh, many of you have used uh, as a continuing means of, of uh, uh, transmitting information and exchanging information among yourselves in the TB vaccine, uh, in the TB vaccine field. So, you know, one of my favorite authors, you know, Charles Dickens uh, uh, says uh, at the start of uh, what is argu arguably, in my mind, his best novel that, you know, it was the, it was both the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, and um, certainly in this uh, last year in which we have found ourselves in dealing with the COVID pandemic, one can certainly describe it uh, uh, in the TB context as being, in fact, one of the worst of times. Uh, the uh, impact on decreases in TB-related services and on TB notifications and on the work that, uh, you know, many of us and our colleagues do uh, in country uh, dealing with TB have been uh, uh, severely impacted and severely delayed in many cases. 
And in addition to that, we have also experienced you know, delays in a lot of our uh, development work, uh, whether it be diagnostics or whether it be drugs or uh, most certainly in, in the field of vaccines and in associated clinical studies. Uh, it has just become a little bit difficult, as we can all imagine, you know, under the current circumstances to, uh, to do this work. But at the same time, you know, we could look at, at the last year as also being reflective of the best of times. And, you know, it sounds strange to say, but why do I say it? Well, you know, in one aspect, it has given us the opportunity uh, once we are hopefully through the uh, COVID pandemic. I realize it will still be a little while, but hopefully we will get through this. It will give us an opportunity to renew our collective focus on TB. You know, we look at the COVID pandemic and we look at the tragedy of having lost uh, what will undoubtedly be over 3 million lives uh, to COVID. But it also reminds us that every year, TB is responsible for the loss of one and a half million lives. And, and, th and that is every year. And it's been continuously like this for, for, for many years. And unless we renew our focus on TB, unfortunately, it will be like this for many years afterwards. You know, I oftentimes tell my colleagues that uh, at the foundation that, uh, you know, once once we get our way through COVID and we've beaten COVID down, uh, that TB, uh, which is a pandemic itself, uh, will still be with us. So hopefully the world will have learned that the kind of effort and the kind of uh, 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 focus that is placed on COVID is also the kind of effort and focus that should be placed on TB. Uh, and that the eventual success that I'm sure we will have with COVID will in the future also translate uh, to, uh, to TB. Part of this renewed focus is also uh, will ref reflects the uh, rather amazing advances that have occurred as a result of the global response on, on, uh, to COVID. Amazing advances from a technical perspective. Uh, the, the, the one area where, where this is most obvious is in diagnostics. Uh, all of the work that has gone on in the past uh, 12 to 14 months on developing novel diagnostics and rapid diagnostics and consistently usable diagnostics for COVID can all be translated almost directly to the development of novel TB diagnostics, you know, moving forward into the future. And then, of course, uh, vaccines. We are beginning uh, to see the impact that a, a successful uh, infectious disease vaccine can have uh, and uh, the impact that novel vaccine technologies, when they're brought to bear, can have on the rapid response to a disease such as COVID. Uh, these are all technologies, novel technologies, novel approaches that uh, uh, hopefully, and I'm, I'm certain will be, uh, focus uh, used to focus on uh, novel advances in TB vaccine R and D again as we move forward as we move forward into the into the coming years. Here at the foundation, as I said, we remain committed because nothing can deal with an infectious disease as well as a vaccine can. Uh, I think we all clearly know that. So we do remain focused on our efforts uh, in support of TB vaccine uh, research and, de and development. As many of you know, our sister organization, the Gates Medical Research Institute, right before uh, the start of the COVID pandemic, concluded a licensing agreement for the M72 vaccine from GSK, which, which the uh, uh, Medical Research Institute uh, will bring forward uh, and has already started to bring forward for continued phase three development in the coming years. And uh, we all have our fingers crossed that the impact of that vaccine will be both successful and significant in the future. And of course, we remain committed to novel uh, TB vaccine uh, uh, endeavors moving forward. Again, referring to our uh, ongoing collaboration in TB vaccine discovery and TB vaccine work. And we look forward to the application of novel technologies, including mRNA technologies and uh, various additional uh, technologies that we've all learned about and are learning about that have been brought to bear for, uh, uh, in response to the COVID pandemic, we can bring to bear in response to the TB pandemic moving forward. So thank you uh, for your attention, and I wish uh, everyone a successful virtual conference, and I'm hoping that in the not too distant future, we will be able all to again meet together in person, and uh, that we will hopefully in the future due to TB, what the world will in the hopefully immediately next few years due to COVID. So thank you very much, and um, I uh, wish you again a successful conference. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure now to have the opportunity and truly an honor and a, and a pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Erbelding, 
who is an infectious disease physician, who is the director of the Division of Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the NIH. Um, as director of DMID, Emily oversees a research portfolio of basic translational and clinical research in infectious diseases that exceeds $2 billion a year. Prior to becoming the director of DMID, she was the deputy director of the Division of AIDS. So with respect to her professional um, accomplishments, you can see some of them in, in that description, which is quite impressive in itself. But I think, you know, knowing Emily, I just want to comment on a couple of things about her contributions to DMID and to the NIH more broadly. With the emergence of the Zika outbreak, um, it was clear that the NIH needed to find ways to become more responsive and innovative in dealing with emerging threats. And clearly, the transformation that she helped contribute to in major ways really better prepared us to be dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and I think it's validated the important role that DMID plays, but also the NIH more broadly. She's definitely a global health champion. She's a champion of access to innovative science being of benefit to people living in low-income countries where the impact of many diseases is disproportionately felt. And she's also a major champion of TB um, research, including vaccine research, and played a key role in the important NIH strategy for TB research. And really, the NIH is now the world's largest investor in innovative TB research, and we're very fortunate to have Dr. Erbelding with us today. Thank you, Mark. So I'm most pleased to be with you at this opening session of the Global Forum on uh, TB vaccines. At NIAID, we remain committed to developing new tools that will curb the devastation of the global TB epidemic. And that includes supporting diagnostics, um, therapeutics, and importantly, um, investing in, in innovative approaches to develop uh, a TB vaccine. So, of course, the global COVID epidemic has been devastating in so many ways, and it's, it's not behind us. Um, the fire is still burning, and it's difficult to step back and try to start thinking about lessons that we've learned from this pandemic that can be applied to other global threats, such as tuberculosis. Um, I think the, the promise of uh, new vaccine platforms, such as the mRNA vaccine, has already been uh, highlighted as one of the important lessons that we will take away from this epidemic, that, that gene-encoded um, antigens with an antigen produced by the host can uh, mount, can lead to the mounting of a very effective and protective immune response. And we demonstrated that with COVID. But I think one other important lesson that we've learned, um, particularly in the United States from dealing with this pandemic is that focused multidisciplinary teams of scientists with resources that come together every day, people from the bench, people that develop assays, people that are experts in manufacturing, working with regulators, coming together every day and thinking about the next step to get a vaccine out there, um, what the roadblocks might be, thinking about what can we do to save time, what can we do in parallel rather than waiting sequentially. Putting all those steps together and moving forward together is what it takes to go from developing a vaccine over decades to developing one in less than a year and leading to saving lives. And I think that lesson, the multidisciplinary teams meeting together and constantly thinking about how they can make, how they can accelerate progress and move faster will be what it takes to deal with the other threats such as tuberculosis. And so thank you very much for this invitation to speak this morning. I um, am, I, we are remain committed to TB vaccine. We look forward to the day that we can pivot back from our work on COVID to the other chronic challenges that have, that have plagued us for decades um, and apply the lessons that we've learned from COVID to uh, other global health threats such as tuberculosis. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emily, for your, your participation and your tremendous efforts in support of TB um, research and your very thoughtful comments today. We really appreciate it. 
Thanks. Uh, let, let me uh, join Mark and thank you, Emily, uh, for for these uh, thoughts you shared with us, particularly the idea of this of, of the multidiscipline teams meeting daily to to advance uh, the, the field. It's. Uh, I'm happy to introduce. Uh, to introduce Michael uh, Michael Makanga is the executive director of EDTCP. Michael is a clinician scientist with uh, 25 years of experience working on health and poverty related infectious diseases in sub Saharan Africa. And that includes 21 years of work experience on medical management and clinical activities. Michael holds a degree from McMurray University in Uganda and has a Clinical and teacher positions before and after undertaking a master's degree at the University of Liverpool and then a PhD in the School of Tropical Medicine. Michael's a fellow of the physicians in Edinburgh and is a uh, very scientific and policy advisory board for international development, philanthropic organizations, the World Bank, and companies involved in developing medicine products for poverty related infectious diseases. Michael is also currently the chair of the Global Partnership. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with Michael uh, over the past few years in the department um, in 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 development activities, um, and I've had a chance to see firsthand Michael's leadership in moving the field. Uh, we're very happy to have Michael with us today. Uh, over to you, Michael. First, I'd like to. Um thank the organizers of this meeting and to say special hello to all the esteemed participants to this meeting. TB is a major global public health challenge that is claiming more than 1.4 million people annually. The fight against TB will not be complete without the addition of TB vaccines. And the World Health Organization has clearly identified a need for three distinct types of TB vaccines. A safe, effective and affordable TB vaccine for adolescents and adults, an affordable vaccine for infants that is superior to BCG, a therapeutic vaccine to improve treatment outcomes. Now, towards this novel cause, EDCTP and the Amsterdam Institute for Global Health and Development will officially launch a global TB vaccine roadmap uh, on research and development, and this will be done in this forum, and I want to encourage you to attend this in the special forum. This deliverable follows a highly, uh, this deliverable follows a highly consultative process that was carried out in close collaboration with the World Health Organization, and this roadmap will complement the global value proposition for TB vaccines that is currently being developed by WHO to galvanize support for TB vaccine uh, uh, TB vaccines are under funding. Now, three specific thematic priorities have been identified for the development and implementation of new TB vaccines with the aim to coordinate and accelerate the global action. First is the need for diversifying TB vaccine pipeline. Second, are accelerating the evaluation of TB vaccines. And thirdly, ensuring public health impact is increased recognizing that beyond licensure of a new vaccine, there is need to circumvent the multiple barriers that may hinder the timely implementation of these vaccines. Now, focusing on accelerating clinical development of TB vaccines, which is the main mandate of EDCTP, we all know that clinical evaluation of TB vaccines is slow, high risk, and costly, and this is attributed to two main barriers. First is the fact that the efficacy in animal models is not a good predictor of efficiency of, of efficacy in people, making it difficult to prioritize candidates for clinical evaluation. Secondly, the lack of well-defined correlates of protection or proxy measures of efficacy. Demonstrating of efficacy therefore requires large trials with prevention of disease as the primary endpoint. Now this presents actions for us. We need to optimize animal models by back translating findings from successful trials, we need, to optim we need to optimize endpoints and we need to harmonize standardized trial protocols and explore innovative trial designs to improve efficiency. And we also need to ensure that the capacity is built in high burden countries. EDCTP as an organization has taken key responsibilities and we are now making considerable investments in three 
uh, clinical trials. First is the prevention of relapse TB, a vaccine trial, which is a phase 2B. And this is uh, based on fusion, pro uh, fusion protein based A56 candidate vaccine uh, on prevention of relapse as the approach in adults. The second is a phase 2B uh, MTB VAC, and this is in newborns. This is a phase 2B study that is evaluating an attenuated form of TB bacterium, potentially offering a better alternative to BCG. And the third is a phase 3 trial, which is the prime study. Uh, evaluating VPM1002, and this is uh, a recombinant BCG uh, vaccine in comparison that is being evaluated in comparison with BCG in five uh, sub-Saharan African countries. Towards opportunities to strengthen international collaboration and support for development of TB vaccines, the Global TB Vaccine Partnership, a forum for key stakeholders in TB vaccine R&D, including funding organizations, industry, product development partners, national governments, and public and private organizations that are investing in or otherwise contributing to research and development related to TB vaccines is an excellent platform. We also partnering with TBVI in uh, coordination of uh, TB vaccine uh, projects and also to develop, establish, and make publicly available a set of guidance documents and web-based tools. The future EDCTP program will have more focus on late-stage clinical trials and product-focused implementation research, and this will require increased global collaboration and more flexible funding modalities, and TB remains a key priority in this program. We remain fully committed to open science, promoting highly collaborative research and development, bidirectional capacity development to accelerate vaccine R&D in the context of sustainable, of sustainable development goals. And in conclusion, we all need to seize the opportunity to recognize the importance of achieving new TB vaccines in the context of global efforts to end TB, considering lessons learned from the current COVID-19 pandemic. We look forward to hearing the scientific progress that has been achieved in the recent years that will be presented at this forum. Thank you very much for your attention. This session, and, and we'll be reconvening um, shortly before we leave you, I just want to thank all of the speakers for their really tremendous contributions to this morning or afternoon, evening, depending on where you are in the world session. Um, in particular, I want to you know, thank um, the Indian Minister of Health, Dr. Vardam, um, Dr. Reese, Dr. Amini, Dr. Herbalding, and Dr. McKenga for their very insightful um, presentations. I also want to acknowledge the important contributions of the organizers of the meeting, the Stop TB Partnership Working Group on New TB Vaccines, TBVI, and, and IAVI, um, and also the sponsors of the meeting, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, BioFabri, FHI Clinical, EDCTP, DSW, Tissues and Sal Carta for their making this meeting possible. And I want to thank all of you for your contributions and commitment to TB vaccine development. You know, clearly we all are aware of the challenges and we've been reminded of them, but we've also have reason to be optimistic. And it's a good time for us to not only renew, but augment our commitment to accelerating the development of highly efficacious TB vaccines to bring the TB pandemic under control and hopefully one day see it come to an end. So thanks very much for your efforts and engagement.